Hi, everyone. Thanks very much. Um, so I'm going to give a very different talk uh, to probably most other people today. Um, primarily, we're nothing to do with e-commerce, although one of our largest clients is uh, Amazon, so very relevant to e-commerce. Um, I'm going to talk about disruption more generally. So we're a fintech company, which is kind of um, all the rage at the moment. Um, but um, I want to talk about a bunch of things that I've learned over the years uh, from my time as an entrepreneur, uh, but also as an investor. So as an investor, uh, before I did C2FO, um, I'd invested in companies that had raised, uh, e-commerce companies that had raised uh, roughly a billion dollars, billion US dollars. So I saw a lot of uh, things work. I saw some big failures. <laughs> um, I even saw some become incredibly profitable. Um, so it is definitely possible. So I'm going to try and talk about learnings I've had over the years. And then I will talk a little bit about what C2FO does um, and how the, the, what sounds like a very boring concept of working capital is crucial for you if you're an e-commerce business that holds inventory. If you have the luxury of being a huge marketplace, you can ignore a lot of this. So I start with something that, you know, it's very well known. You know, technology keeps marching on. Um, I think Intel said the other day that they're still good for quite a long time with Moore's Law. It's not going to break down. And every year, there's more information created than all other years put together. So every single sector in the world is, is being disrupted. Um, we've got very obvious ones, like communication. Uh, before mobile, games were a little less obvious. Now you think it's super obvious. Um, five years ago, if someone told you you'd click a button and get a cab, they would say you were insane. Um, and now Uber, well, they're here, they're everywhere, not just Uber, but many others. Um, and what's taken much longer is fintech. Um, why? Because it's really complex. So like you heard earlier from, from Zlora, um, you know, e-commerce is hugely operational, highly complex, cross-border is super duper difficult. Um, so is financial technology. You've got to deal with regulation, banks, and banks aren't going away, they're just having to change the way they do business. And so if you're here and you're thinking, hey, should I start up, let's say an e-commerce site or a marketplace or indeed any form of startup, there are a few things I think it's good to have in your mind. And first thing is, you know, Silicon Valley is not a place. Of course it is a place, but really it's a state of mind. So. You're lucky in Taiwan. I come to Taiwan a lot. And you've got fantastic universities, a huge amount of engineering talent. You've got the luxury of having a small lo uh, local market, which I say is a luxury because it means you have to go beyond your local market to build a huge business. This is uh, one of the biggest issues in the US. It's such a large local market that a lot of companies forget about the rest of the world. You know, one of my good friends started Skype. Um, the first country that became huge for it in Asia was Taiwan. Uh, Skype was founded by uh, a, someone who was Danish and someone who's Swedish, two very small countries. And they had to think global from the first day. Um, now, that's not so easy with e-commerce, of course. Um, it's not so easy to compete with Amazon. Um, but if you want to be in a niche, then absolutely it's doable. So you've got to take risks, and you've got to be prepared to fail. So if everyone in here started a business, especially in e-commerce, it's very likely you'll fail. And there's nothing wrong with that. You'll learn from it and you'll get stronger. And you, you want to hire people that they don't want to go to work for a job. They've got, it, it, it's actually a vocation. It's what every, every day they wake up, they're excited by what you, the founders of the company, um, or the senior management are trying to do. So you've got to find people like that. Um, and again, whether you're really trying to change the world or not, you've got to have a deep belief that you're really trying to change something very deep. And so, there's, if you read the press, which I'm sure everyone does, um, there's, the press will tell you all startups are started by someone on the left, a Zuckerberg, um, or let's see, Evan Spiegel and Snapchat, or whatever. This is just totally the exception. Um, don't get me wrong, Zuckerberg was a brilliant coder and you build a $300 billion business, so it's not so bad. 
But the vast majority of people that build successful businesses are the Mark Benioffs of the world. He actually worked for Larry Allison as his protege for about 13 years at Oracle before he started Salesforce. Um, and if we think, of how is this relevant to e-commerce? Well, like you heard earlier, um, it's, it's a complex operational business. Um, and if you don't, if you're just fresh from university and sure, you can code a great website, it might look great too. Retail is detail. And so having some, one of the best things you can do if you want to start a company is get some experience in a company that really teaches you some great operational skills. It could be an offline company or an online, it doesn't matter. They still use warehousing, for example. They still have to market. Of course, increasingly, both are diverging, converging. And it's also really, 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 really hard to build a business. I'd say it's even harder in e-commerce. Why? Because you need bucket loads of capital. You're selling products with generally not great margin, though there are exceptions. Um, and it's competitive. So again, if you read the press, um, the left-hand side is how all startups are. Um, with foosball tables and beer on tap and all of this. Well, yeah, yeah, maybe on a Friday afternoon for half an hour. But the reality is the right-hand side. Um, it's hard. You've got to work your butt off 24-7. And one of the things I saw as an investor um, and also as an entrepreneur is a lot of people think it's cool to be in a startup because they've heard it's cool. Um, and, um, and that's the reason they want to be in it. They're not actually doing it because they want to change something. So whatever you do, don't, don't found a company or don't join a startup if your heart's not in it because it will be the hardest thing you've ever done. Um, and I'm making no apologies for that. I don't know of any company, even the most successful companies, uh, who didn't have d tough times. And another very important point, and this is hugely relevant for e-commerce, is focusing on your strengths. It says especially with fintech, but this is e-commerce too. So, you know, the quote here is Jack Welsh. He, uh, well, he built GE into the kind of force it is today. If you don't have a competitive advantage, don't compete. Um, and um, so if, if you're thinking you're going to, I don't know, Amazon's not so relevant here. Um, but say, you know, if, you, if your startup was just going to take on PC Home, for example, um, you know, that's fine. That's not a bad thing to try and do. But how are you really differentiating? What's your real advantage? How can you, and this is a BSOS quote from the 1997 Amazon letter, how can you widen and deepen the moat around your business? How can every time you grow and do something new, how do you make it harder for someone to compete with you? It's surprisingly interesting that, and having looked at probably hundreds of e-commerce companies when I was an investor, how few people can, answer, how few people can actually answer this question well. Um, you know, it, and, um, and there's a big, big, big difference between getting, it's very hard to get an e-commerce site off the ground unless you just have a lot of capital. Um, it's even harder to scale it, and then it's even even harder still to build it through to a mature, profitable business model. So you've got to focus on your strengths. And really what that means is you've got to do one thing, not two or three things, but one thing massively better than anyone else. The number one reason I saw, uh, in fact, most startups, but especially e-commerce startups, fail was they try to do too many things at once do one, have one product or service, um, or one niche, or whatever it might be. Think back to the early days of Amazon. They sold books. And then, you know what? A couple of years later, they started selling CDs and DVDs. And if you think about it, they're the same size as books. They're about the same weight. The logistics are fairly similar. It took them many, many years to be the everything store that they are today. So, you know, some people today are a little bit no, they, they rush things, and you've got to have a great core business first. Now, luckily for everyone in the room, um, most incumbents will fail to innovate. There are huge exceptions, Apple being probably the most famous. Um, you know, Amazon, of course, in e-commerce, fantastically innovative company. So it's one of my favorite quotes, if you don't cannibalize yourself, someone else will. Um, this was a analyst who was asking Steve Jobs when he was talking about launching the iPhone. Um, and they said, well, won't it cannibalize your iPod revenue? And Jobs says, of course it will. Um, and then said this quote. But it's important because why, you know, we're in a world which is going increasingly online. We all know that. Now there's 
also increasingly increasing convergence between online and offline, being in both at once. So there's huge opportunity to disrupt incumbents. And again, if you think back to the last slide, you've got to do one thing massively better than they do. Um, so you, know, you can capitalize on just the fact that big companies find it hard to innovate, well, most big companies. And so as I talked about, um, and you know, Google's a great example of this, um, you know, you've got to focus. Um, for the first five years of Google's existence, from 98 to 2003, it really did nothing but have a blank page where you type, well, pretty much blank, where you type what you wanted into a box. Didn't have a business model. Um, it, um, it worked that out, obviously, rather well. But that's all it did. And then G Gmail came along, Google Groups, and all sorts of other things. Now they've earned the right to build self-driving cars and go to the moon and all this type of stuff. But again, this is trying to reinforce the point. You've got to do one thing better than everyone else, and not just everyone in Taiwan, everyone else in the world, because it's becoming increasingly competitive. Hey, you might have an app which is you know, distributed globally. Um, it could be a marketplace or whatever. Well, then, hey, you're up against, um, say, Wallapop in Europe, as well as people in the US. Um, you know, there's no reason why the next huge e-commerce app can't come from here. There's the talent. Um, but you, but I think the key thing I've seen is you've got to think, you've got to think big. And there's another quote, not, not a well-known person, but a, a great investor at one of the best VCs in the world, a guy called Joseph. Um, and um, this goes back to doing one thing, or maybe two things, but they've got to be 10 times better at least, ideally 100 times better than anyone else. Um, so I'm obsessed with TransferWise. Um, it's founded by one of the early employees of Skype. Um, I'm English, as you might be able to tell. I live in Hong Kong. I use it all the time to transfer money. Versus a bank, it is at least 10 times cheaper. It's massively simpler, probably 100 times simpler. And the one time I had a small issue, the customer service was amazing. That makes me go back time and time and time again. Um, and um, I even, I loved it so much, I, 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 I pushed one of my friends to join the company as the CFO now. So, you know, it's... Uh, but it's the same with e-commerce. Think of what Amazon did, you know, for, for their strategy, which is a very high-risk strategy, which, which is what Jet.com are trying to do at the moment, trying to have everything, the everything store, huge amounts of SKUs, i.e. different products, um, 10 times the selection of anyone, um, you know. But um, that's a very tough game if that's the one you're trying to play. Um, so, and then... There's another lovely phrase you hear a lot, which used to be the corporate motto of Facebook, move fast and break things. Uh, it actually got removed as their motto about a year and a half ago. Um, and um, really, this, this comes from a Henry Ford quote. Um, he had lots of good quotes, um, but failure is simply the opportunity to begin again, this time more intelligently. Um, he also famously said that if he listened to his customers, he would build a faster horse as opposed to uh, making the first mass-produced car. And I've debated this in my mind, whether this quote is... By the way, it's totally irrelevant to fintech, because if you break stuff, people lose money and you're dead. Like, so it's irrelevant for fintech. I was trying to work out how relevant it is for e-commerce. Um, and maybe with some marketplace models, yeah. Um, but if you're taking inventory and you're screwing things up, you, you, you're, you're going to be toast. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in a sec. Um, and again, what's really easy when you start a company, when you're like 20 people, you're in a room all sitting next to each other, hey, maybe your warehouse is literally next door. It's super easy to have a great culture because you know everyone, you talk to them every day, the founders are all there, you know, it's not hard. You're in one location. So Tony Shi from Zappos, you know, created a great culture. You know, Netflix is another company. There's all sorts of, you know, Google, Facebook. Um, and if you are founding a company and it's really starting to work, you know, when this gets difficult, it's not when you're 20 people. It's when you're 120 people. It's when you're over three sites in four countries. It's when you have to have two warehouses in different locations. And what everything, so this is why founders are so crucial to keep the culture of a company um, and you know what? Why did I move from London to Hong Kong? Because I was setting up our business in Asia. Because I had to be here. If I was trying to do it from London, 
would fail massively. So I'm going to talk a bit about working capital disruption. I'm sure there's some people rolling their eyes. This sounds very, very boring. It's actually the world's biggest market. Um, there's literally no market bigger. And also, if you're trying to build a business that has inventory, if I think about the e-commerce companies I saw fail, um, there's probably three big decisions financially you have to make. You've got to work out what gross margin you want to have. You know what? You can be JD.com and say, you know what? We're going to sell stuff for nothing or negative gross margin. And that's fine if you raise $10 billion, which you might be able to do. I mean, they have. Um, you've got to think of how much money you spend on marketing. Um, again, um, you have had companies that have spent very little, others who have spent hundreds of millions of dollars and failed. Um, and the third bit, which people always forget because it's geeky, is your working capital. If you're trying to build an e-commerce company that has inventory, and if you're trying to grow that company fast, that you're going to start with a horrible working capital cycle where you can't get credit from suppliers because you're risky and they want you to pay in advance. So you're having to buy inventory before you've sold it. Sure, if you're Amazon, it flips the other way and it works like a really, then you have a negative working capital cycle, which is great. But actually, every single e-commerce company I invested in underestimated this hugely. And the reason e-commerce companies generally have to raise so much capital is actually working capital. Um, so, so a bit about my company C2FO, so we've raised about 100 million US dollars um, from some of the great investors of the world, Tiger Global, Tomasek, uh, Union Square Ventures, Mithril is Peter Thiel. Um, so we've never had a massive problem raising money, but raising money is not success, it is the beginning. <laughs> um, and we're in the fintech space. Um, now if you read newspapers, at the moment and online, you'll just hear about P2P lending all the time. It seems that's the only thing that anyone wants to talk about, um, which is fine, but actually it's a tiny, tiny piece of the overall puzzle. I mean, that's sure, there could be hundreds of billions of P2P loans made a year eventually, but you're talking about a market where there's um, literally hundreds of trillions of dollars of, of, of flows of money every year and lots of other ways to disrupt that. So the idea we came up with was, and this is a like I talked about, a huge problem for small, medium-sized businesses um, is, um, is basically to help suppliers get paid early from their suppliers. So, so right now in the world, um, there's about 35 to 40 trillion US dollars owed between companies. So Amazon, who's one of our clients, owes tens of thousands of suppliers, well, many billions of dollars right now. If you add that up for all companies, it's a huge number. 40, 35 to 40 trillion. So each year that means there's uh, about 200, 250 trillion dollars of money that flows from businesses to other businesses. And it's financed by a few trillion dollars of bank financing. There's a gap, but equally in the dark green, there's a huge amount of money that's just locked up. Um, in effect, suppliers are funding, they're acting as banks for their own customers, which is slightly unfair as a lot of the customers have a much better credit position than their suppliers. Um, and this is getting much, much worse. Um, it's very hard to get data in Asia, um, but US and Europe, um, there's, well, hundreds of billions less lending to small businesses every year. Um, it's uh, the same trend in Asia, but I mean, China's had different dynamics, to be fair. Um, and um, the payment terms are very long. So again, if you're starting your e-commerce business, you, you're not going to get good credit terms at first because you're risky. And people are going to want you to pay up front. But as you mature, you can you know, pay people 10 days late, you know, sorry, in 10 days, in 30 days, in 50 days, in 90 days. Um, and if we think of where we are now in Taiwan, you know, some of the longest payment terms in the world are here, you know, 75 days on average. Um, so if you're building your little Excel model right now for your new business, think about this. If you can get long payment terms and you're trying to grow an e-commerce business with inventory, this will change how much money you need to make to raise hugely, which will mean you're not as diluted as a founder. Your equity is going to be worth a lot more. Um, so we built a marketplace for working capital. Um, not, there wasn't one. It's sort of bizarre that there was no marketplace for a market that's $200 trillion in size, but it's true. Um, like eBay's a marketplace, Priceline, uh, bats, no one's heard of, but it's actually the world's largest stock exchange. 
And it's a quite a new company, last 15 years or so. Um, and so we build a marketplace that helps your, basically, buyers collaborate with their suppliers. Um, so a buyers set a, a target for how much uh, return they want to make on their own cash. Uh, that's cash on their balance sheet. And where suppliers uh, each bid a unique rate that they, that they want to be paid early. So I might be willing to give you a 2% discount to be paid tomorrow as, as opposed to in 60 days. Um, and where we, this has existed, by the way, for thousands of years, this concept, since the beginning of time. Um, when people owed each other money, you could be paid early for a discount. But what we realized was that all the models in the market, and again, there's a lot of analogies to e-commerce e here. Um, the buyer was setting the rate for every supplier that they had to pay. And it was the same rate for all suppliers, which makes no sense, because you could have a supplier that's Procter & Gamble, doesn't need money. At the same time, you could have a supplier that is a business of two people that's desperate for funding. So we realized if we flip this on its head, and this was the real disruption, get each supplier bidding to be paid early with an offer they're happy with, um, that actually we worked out, and it's just simple maths, you can actually make a lot more money. Um, and so there's a really horrible chart, which is the best chart in the world, actually. But um, we, um, we obviously tested this hypothesis. And again, if you're going to disrupt something in e-commerce, think about why you're going to be different. Then get the data and see if it's right. It's so easy these days to get data. So what this shows on the y-axis are the uh, annual percentage rates. So these are not discount rates, but annualized discount rates that uh, suppliers are willing to bid to be paid early by their customers. Every line is a different supplier. The x-axis shows across about a month, uh, 26 days, the different rates they're willing to bid every single day. And you can see that these are not straight lines. Um, just like your business will have different needs for cash every day, um, all businesses do. It doesn't matter what sector you're in. And so we immediately realized that we were onto something, and we were right, uh, that we could disrupt an industry that's gigantic with just a new idea and a new product. And so this has enabled us so far to, well, we use the term liberate, uh, tens of billions of US dollars of working capital for businesses around the world. Obviously, we'd like that to be many trillions of dollars. Um, and, um, you know, we're growing extremely fast. And, um, you know, we want to solve one of the biggest problems the world has, which is how do, business, how do suppliers around the world, small businesses, which make up over half the world's economy, get access to the capital they need to grow their business. Thank you very much.